Hello, everyone. My name is Khan Chalgama, and I'm with Toffler Associates, a future-focused strategic advisory firm. So I am not a security expert. My expertise is in understanding the changes in the security and protection space. I help organizations in the security and protection space to um, understand what drivers could affect their business environment and help them think through um, their organizational strategies so they could be prepared for the future. My goal with this webinar is not to spit out a list of uh, specific future-focused risk metrics that you could just go and adopt immediately. You'll see in this webinar that the future-focused risk metrics don't work that way. My goal is to help you position your risk management program and metrics so you're able to show its value to the organization, how it is helping the organization to create, preserve, and protect what is important to your organization. So decision makers and influencers like your executives and your board members can understand that if they want their organization to succeed in the future, they have to invest in a forward thinking real um, risk management program and also incorporate it into their organizational strategies. So what does future focus risk metrics mean? It means risk management metrics that continuously assess the risk environment to protect and create enterprise wealth and enable an organization to identify anticipate and mitigate risk. So think of what happened recently with Amazon. All it took was a presidential tweet and the stock tumbled. Look at the scandal that's happening with Facebook and the stock has dipped and they've had to uh, reevaluate their users privacy control settings. Then look at what happened in mid-March with the city of Atlanta where the government computer systems were hacked by a malware attack and uh, the hackers were demanding a $51,000 ransom in Bitcoin. This, I think, was supposed to be the biggest cyber attack against the U.S. city ever. So when you look at this, Amazon, Facebook, City of Atlanta, these are huge companies and cities. They're the movers and shakers in the industry. So if they are having issues, you're not protected. You're not immune to the security threats and vulnerabilities. So it's not a question of if it's going to happen to you, it's a matter of when. So you have to be prepared. You have to think about what is coming in the future. How can you protect your organization? That's why future-focused risk metrics are important. So let me give you the answer up front. Your future-focused risk metrics have to be based on these three platforms. Knowing your risk management program, knowing your organization's business and its customers, and knowing your organization's wealth recovery costs. So, to better anticipate these future challenges in this rapidly changing threat environment, you have to first understand what's the current environment. How is that environment changing or being changed? What are some of the ch challenges because of these changes? And what's driving these changes at the global level, at the regional level, and at the local level? And how does that affect you and your organization? Also, most importantly, what's valuable to your organization that you're expected to be protecting through your risk management program? Having that understanding is going to help you think through how to approach future-focused risk management. So what is risk management? Risk managed to me, or how I interpret in this presentation, is protecting what's valuable to my organization. I call that organizational wealth. So risk management is protecting the wealth of an organization. People are used to having a compliance-based model for protecting critical assets. So you were used to protecting buildings, people, and information, and all your metrics were around that. But what I'm talking about is a little more than that. People are not used to thinking about it this way. That's why you need to be open and approach risk management from a very different mindset if you want to be thinking and preparing for the future. So you have to do your head work to understand what's valuable to your organization. The definition of wealth is very different for each organization. You have to figure out the wealth of your organization on your own. There has to be some deep thought that has to go into it, the head work that has to happen before the footwork. 
So organization A's wealth is going to be very different from organization B's wealth. And a dollar figure is not going to be the most adequate way to measure wealth, especially in this third wave, going on to the fourth wave. It's more than money. So what other ways can you measure wealth? Wealth is not just the traditional critical assets of buildings, people, and information. So for example, if your company moves from being number one to number 15 in the market, your company could go out of business. So maybe it's the position in the marketplace. Maybe it's measured in time. So for example, if you're a drug manufacturer and it takes roughly 12 years to get an FDA approval on a drug, um, then And then what if your, your work, your IP was stolen overnight? So maybe the metric and what's valuable to you may be that time. Then for another organization, it may be market share or brand or the reputation it has or the public perception of how safe it is to work with that organization. What if you're a satellite company? If so, what if you lost the spectrum or the space for your satellite uh, that's, you know, traveling around uh, maybe Mars or Earth? What could be the wealth that was lost? It's not always cost. So in order to think about future focus risk metrics, you first have to understand where we came from and where we are now, right? So let's look at 20 years ago, 1998. What was it like in 1998? Believe it or not, Titanic dominated the Oscars in 1998. It seems like yesterday, but that was 20 years ago. Google was founded in 1998, and the first Apple iMac came out then too. If you think of security threats that we were facing 20 years ago, Osama bin Laden published a fatwa declaring jihad against all the Jews in 1998. NASA and the U.S. Navy were targets for denial of service attacks on their computers that had windows. AOL Trojans spammed AOL email addresses with Trojanized attachments to steal information from AOL users. So in 1998, your primary focus probably was on protecting buildings and the people inside them. Hackers were only just getting started. So now let's look at 2018. Now our threats are mutating exponentially. So we need to think about cyber threats, insider threats, dangers from non-state actors, IoT products, nanotechnology weapons, then also the products that we have are also becoming smart and connected to AI, which means now we're gonna have more data that's going to be available and more ways to use and exploit that data as well. And these are just the things we know about in 2018. So what are some of the challenges we see right now? State-sponsored attacks seems to be out in the news these days quite a bit too. Um, Department of Homeland Security and FBI just released a technical alert last month about Russian state-sponsored cyber operations against our um, critical national infrastructure, uh, targeting our energy facilities. And uh, right after I had read about it, a week later, I saw that one of our natural energy plants were attacked uh, from cyber attacks. Ransomware for monetization seems to be the biggest threat to organizations in 2018. Ransomware attacks have quadrupled since 2015, and cryptocurrency is making it easy for all these hackers to get away anonymously collecting ransom. A prime example is the uh, the city of Atlanta that I talked about and, and the troubles they went through in mid-March. Crime as a service is also something we, we are seeing these days. Th what this is doing is it's allowing any aspiring cyber criminal on the street without that much technical knowledge to be able to just buy tools and services and conduct a cyber attack. And they even have help desk services for, the, for these potential cyber criminals. Then we see a lot of um, the use of botnets and digital armies for mass scale and automated attacks. Saudi Arabia has been experiencing quite a bit of this in the past six months uh, with their petrochemical companies. They've had a slew of uh, cybersecurity uh, attacks from these botnets 
luckily what had happened was there was a coding error. So that's what prevented uh, any physical damage to those companies. Supply chain vulnerabilities. So security risks don't come to us anymore directly into our organizations. What hackers are doing is they are trying to find weak links and trying to compromise our organizations through third parties, such as our sale of vendors, our utility providers, and component suppliers, et cetera. So that's an area that we have quite a bit of challenges as well. Mobile malware, think about all the data you're generating through your watches and phones, not just you know, your financial, your banking data, but places you go, what you do, who you talk to, all that tracked through either your phone or your watch. What we've seen is by the end of 2016, there were approximately 15 million different mobile malware variants. And by the end of 2016, 8% of these mobile users had been infected by some sort of mobile malware. So imagine it's 2028 now. What are some of the characteristics you'll see in your security and protection environment? One of the things you'll see is the rapid development and adaption of new technology which means that there's going to be more data and more uses for that data and abuse for that data as well. So think about the miniaturization and nanotechnology that's being developed. What that does is organizations can now put whole systems into a single tiny chip. So think about now what we can send to space without all that weight, right? Think about weapons being miniaturized and our traditional detection systems won't be able to detect them because they're so tiny. Another characteristic we see is the continuous sensing and monitoring using artificial intelligence. Our artificial intelligence will change how systems and machines interface and communicate with each other and how, how operations are going to be run in an organization. So AI is going to generate information we did not have access to before. It will give us new uses for data and also create new value for the data we already have in an organization. So we see a shift towards AI-driven scanning tools instead of the compliance-driven ones we have now. So what that's going to do is we are going to have that constant learning about the environment and detecting anomalies real time. Brand and reputation are extremely important in 2028. It's going to be the game changer for an organization and it's going to be based on the security of the company. So organizations' reputation is going to be measured on how secure it is to use your company's products and services and how your company handles that data. So think of the issue Facebook has been having um, lately with, their, with the way they handle their, their customer data. Uh, that has really affected the brand name and the company's reputation, and their stocks have stumbled almost close to 12%, and customers are trying to flee Facebook. The public perception of security is going to be important in 2028 because that's going to drive consumer behavior. With almost everything going to be done online, consumers are going to gravitate towards companies where they trust their information is going to be secure and private. So the, the security and protection program of a company is going to be very important to, to drive the company's brand and reputation. We also see security being implemented seamlessly into organizational processes. It's not an infringement to a customer's experience interacting with your company. It's where you know a customer doesn't even realize he or she is taking part in some of your security measures. So for example, instead of a customer you now being hassled to go through x-ray machines and body pat downs and showing ID, by the time they walk into your facility without any interruptions, non-intrusive cameras and recognition software have already identified them and your sales rep is, has a report already on that person's product preferences and previous order history. So the global scale of business and government operations will continue to blur and redefine traditional boundaries in 2028. Traditional geographic boundaries are not going to be relevant because societies are going to be living in smart environments and smart cities. The lines between customers, 
organizations, employees, and the market are also blurring. A customer at one point could also be a supplier in another transaction. So as the ecosystem of an organization keeps evolving, what you're going to be protecting is also going to keep changing. We also see an increased willingness and, a, and the capability for organizations to partner and collaborate. What this does is it will allow organizations to provide very tailored, flexible, and scalable solutions, which means your competition is going to be high. Organizations ha will have to partner and collaborate if they want to meet customer needs. Also, we saw an evolving attitude towards privacy. The new generation is going to have a whole different meaning to the word privacy. It's about how much data do I give to get what I want. It's about how much do I trust someone or an organization to give, give them my data. Is trust that important or do I even care? Those are the evolving attitudes people will have towards privacy. So what is driving these shifts? We narrowed it down to three drivers that will influence the security and, uh, security and protection landscape in the next 10 years. So the drivers are a way to understand the changes that will happen. They are basically what causes the future to happen. Um, they'll shape the future that's going to change uh, in the security and protection market. So use these drivers to help you better anticipate the risk and threat that could be coming your way. So the first driver that we saw is the pace and rate of change. Think of this as desynchronization. So think of cars traveling in the same direction at different speeds on a highway. So the Maserati that is going at 100 miles an hour, miles an hour represents commercial organizations. The Audi that is going at a moderate speed represents government agencies. The slowest car on the road represents maybe government security policies. So these different rates of change cause unpredictability. For example, if I'm a Boeing and my sub is north of Grumman, the rate at which I'm securing my IT systems is going to be very different from the rate North of Grumman is securing its IT systems versus its subcontractors and its suppliers securing their IT systems. Also, as communication technologies have you know, advanced, we have email, we have text, we have video conferencing. What studies have found is although the communication technologies have advanced, it's almost the, the time to make decisions have or almost doubled. So if your threats are increasing exponentially and decision making and policy changes are changing at totally different slower paces, that is that desynchronization. This is going to affect how you set up your risk program and your risk metrics. And that's probably going to cause you some challenges too. So the second driver we saw was threat uncertainty. What this means, it's an individual's perception of safety versus the reality of how safe the actual environment is. So if, are we trading privacy for security? The more information you have, the more you feel insecure. So you keep asking, what is the truth? What information is real? So it's that perception of security or insecurity, and perception is what's going to matter because that's going to influence how you behave. So a good example is after 9-11, people felt very insecure, but historically, we were the most secure then. There's also studies that talk about the perception of security or insecurity and how that can cause people to change their behavior. This is actually a serious problem in urban populations because when the perception of security is different from the actual reality of crime rates, policymakers, they have to make extra efforts like targeted brand marketing and things like that to alter the perception so they can attract people into the city. Authority is the third driver. So there are blurred lines of authority and question of who is responsible for security and protection rules, policies, governance, etc. Is it the government or the private sector? 
Is it state or federal government? Is it the international community or international organization? Or is it a partnership between public and private sectors? So for example, who owns the data that is generated through your Apple Watch or phone? Who's responsible for protecting that data? Who decides how that information is going to be protected? So DHS and TSA set rules at airports. Who are all the rule makers that are going to affect your organization? So looking at these drivers, what does all this mean to you? An organization's security is usually implemented through a very compartmentalized model. I call it like a separate stepchild, right? Rather than an integrated team member. So risk management is all often brought in late into any strategic decision-making process, if at all. So the status quo risk management you have in place is not going to be enough or relevant in the future. You and your executives have to think of risk management from a different mindset if you want to prepare for the market shift. To be or not to be in 2028, that's the question. Security and protection will be the differentiator, the game changer that will distinguish a successful organization from the obsolete. So Alvin Toffler, after whom Toffler Associates is named, was a world-renowned futurist. He said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The most important skill of a successful security professional is to build that skill to learn, unlearn, and relearn amongst yourselves and your business executives. That means you need to get comfortable with change. When you design and implement future-focused risk metrics, you will constantly need to censor, assess, and adjust your metrics to make sure you have the most relevant and effective metrics. That's the learning and relearning that will be needed that Alvin Toffler talked about. So how do you think differently about security and risk? First, look at conducting security as a risk-based holistic approach. The biggest challenge we're facing right now is that we have a very regulatory compliance-based approach to managing risk. Hackers are not going to care if you're compliant or not, right? Because they are going to look at your weakest link. Compliance to me is more like a checklist. This approach is very linear and can potentially tell you what can go wrong. It doesn't really tell you what needs to be fixed immediately. And the compliance metrics tend to be more path focused, reactive and recovery, rather than leaning in for prevention, early detection, and most importantly, adding value to the business. You should not have separate siloed personnel security cybersecurity, and physical security programs and metrics. You need to look at managing risk from a very comprehensive standpoint. There is no substitute for comprehensive protection. So risk-based approach lets you think about more, uh, the most likely ways criminals can compromise your systems, so then you can have customized and agile solutions to match that threat. So remember some of the key uh, characteristics of an organization, uh, in 2028, so you need to think about using advances in technology and maybe forming some partnerships and collaborations to collect that real-time data and use that to continuously learn, train, and share. That's how you need to look at risk management from a holistic standpoint. So what's the next approach to thinking differently about security and protection? You need to be on your executive's case to move security and protection from an afterthought, that's basically the back seat of a car, to a forethought with strategy. That means moving to the front seat to sit with the organizational strategy. Risk management has to be embedded within the organizational strategy. So the organization can anticipate, plan, and be prepared for oncoming threats. It's not an enabler, and it's not a complementer to strategy. It is part of the strategy. It has to be mission essential. It has to be incorporated into your organization's normal business processes. It's not an afterthought, and it definitely can be something that people do just because they have to do it. So 
What this means is that you have to actively educate the business executives. It's constantly grabbing headline examples of what's happening in the industry or with your competitors, and then using those examples and translating that to how re how you, to the relevant impact on your business and what what could happen to your business if that happened to you, and then offering business strategy options not just security options, business strategy options to avoid those risks. And do this repeatedly until you as the security leader are invited into every decision meeting. And don't just focus on risk, look for opportunities as well. That's important. So with this, uh, so let's take a scenario. Your company is planning to acquire a startup in Brazil that has a really, let's say, cool microchip that humans can inject into their bloodstream uh, that allows them to continuously monitor the blood sugar level. So this is going to be a smart product that's going to interact with the owner through the phone and provide real-time feedback. So this is your organization's first international expansion and your company is planning to absorb their staff. Now as the risk professional, what are some of the things you have to think about? Are you going to be able to integrate with their existing systems? How, would that compromise any of your current security processes? Where are the weakest links? Where are the highest risks? What kind of new threats and vulnerabilities do you have to worry about now because of that company or it, that company's suppliers, the third parties, right? Also, what are the chances of somebody hacking into that little microchip while it's inside your customer's bloodstream and trying to manipulate behavior? So with this new strategic direction of your company, not only is it the new risk that you need to think about, it's also the new opportunities, right? What opportunities are there to improve this business strategy using your risk management program? So for example, you can talk about how you can improve your personnel vetting process to speed up international partner deals. You can incorporate sensors and maybe tracking technology with the Brazilian startup company's international supply chain. And so if you can test and prove it internationally, then you can brand it and apply it domestically. So be on the forefront and help executives think, think through business strategy options. That's how you, how you need to think differently. The third way you need to approach your security program is to look at select distributed accountability and responsibility. That means distributing some of the security responsibilities throughout the organization. So as traditional boundaries blur, risk management programs have to be very fluid to sync with the changing ecosystem of an organization, right? So a purely centralized approach is like having a moat or a wall around a castle. It's not going to work. So if you look at the DHS tagline, it, is, it takes a community to protect a community. That's exactly what you will need in 2028. You need a community. So this is another point where you'll have to collect examples and best practices and continuously educate your business executives so that they see that this select decentralized approach is necessary for the organization to succeed. It's not just to mitigate the risk, but it's to make the business successful. So what happens when you have a, this sort of a decentralized, select decentralized approach, is you have that continuous censoring and monitoring that harnesses the localized knowledge, skills, and technology. And at the local level, they'll have real-time situational understanding and awareness of the threats. So they'll be the first people to detect the threat and apply those localized solutions to match that threat. What that allows you to do is to be able to respond immediately for urgent threats. Also, think about collaborating with industry or sector partners to augment your offerings and be your local senses. You don't have to do this alone. So that's what DHS has done with its uh, See Something, Say Something campaign. It's relying on us, the local population, to be one of its local sensors for security. That type of an approach will help you to be agile and responsive to outwit the bad guys. It should be leaning forward to keep pace with the technological advancement. 
So understanding what is causing changes in the security and protection environment in the future and how you need to shift your mindset to approach protection from a different future-focused angle. How do you now design future-focused risk metrics that cut through all the noise and show value to the organization? So security and protection programs are usually seen as an overhead cost, not really a revenue-producing entity, which is why it's even more important because you need to show business leaders why it's an investment. It's an investment in protecting and preserving and also creating organizational wealth. So A is about, when you look at the ABCs of um, risk future-focused risk metrics, A is about knowing the value of your risk management program. You need to be able to take a look at your program and ask, what's the wealth of my organization? What is the wealth I'm protecting? What is the wealth I'm not protecting? So to answer these questions, you really need to understand the scope and the inside out of your security program first. So because of my risk management program and metrics, I was able to prevent, detect, deter, preserve. If they had not been prevented, detected early, deterred, or preserved, how much would it have cost the organization to recover that wealth? Could that wealth ever be recovered? You need to have risk metrics that's able to show how much of detecting, deterring, and preventing your risk program did and quantify the value of damage prevention and wealth preservation. Like I said, this is going to be hard because the definition of wealth is different for each organization, right? So you have to figure out the wealth and the value of that wealth in your organization. There has to be some deep thought that has to go into it, the head work that I talked about. And don't try to do this alone. Talk, get involved with people within your organization. And a dollar figure is not going to be enough to measure wealth. It's more than money. So, for example, let's take the example of Equifax, the biggest data breach we had. Now, they had gaps not addressing vulnerabilities that were already identified. They didn't even have complex password requirements. They didn't even have a vulnerability disclosure program when this breach occur occurred. So if your security program had these gaps and your organizational data was compromised, how much would it cost your organization purely to recover the compromised data and fix all the bugs? How much revenue would your organization lose? How much customer loyalty would it you lose? How much of its brand name would suffer? How much of its market position would it lose? Basically, how much wealth would your organization lose if there was a compromise? Find a way to quantify that. That's the value of your risk management program. Those are the future-focused metrics you need to show. So with an increment of investment in additional risk management, how much more value can the organization realize? So it's about showing the risk management program's value in protecting and preserving organizational wealth. B is about knowing your customer's business, sorry, your organization's business and its customers. So once you have a good grasp of how your risk management program is valuable to your organization, you need to ask, when customers are aware of the risk management and security controls in place and have a positive perception of security about your organization, how much does the organization increase its wealth? That's the question you need to ask. When customers are aware of the risk management in place and the security controls in place and have a positive perception of security, how much does the, does the organization increase its wealth? So security professionals are involved in all parts of a business, right? You have a basic understanding of your organization's business. Do you know what's valuable to your organization? So it's not just about understanding that you're a burger selling company and that you're selling burgers. It's what makes you unique. What is the wealth? Is it the recipe for that special burger sauce or is it that special blend of spices that are mixed into the meat? So are you protecting the recipe or are you protecting the building where the burgers are sold? 
Do you understand what's important to your organization's customers? Can you show how you're creating wealth for your organization? It may be positively changing your organization's customers' perception of security with your organization. So again, perception influences behavior, so they end up coming to your organization versus the competition. So for example, let's say you have a mobile pay system and you have a pre-order app. So what's the advantage or increase in revenue or customer loyalty to your organization because more customers are willing to pre-order and pay with this mobile pay because they know that it's safe to use those in your company. That is what I mean by knowing your organization's business and its customers. You can't be in a silo anymore and be happy just knowing and reporting your operational risk metrics. You have to really understand your organization's business model, its wealth, and how you are contributing to its wealth. This means you'll need to reach across the organization and work with maybe marketing, business development, media relations to really understand and quantify and show the wealth generated from that increased public perception of safety. C of the ABCs is about knowing your recovery costs. That means if something goes wrong, how much would it cost to get back the brand reputation and public perception? So if you're a burger company, look at the risks from how your organization operates its business. Not just from the outside threats, but what are you doing inside and what are you not doing? inside your organization. Can you calculate the cost if some famous customer came and ate at your burger place and got sick and the media found out? What's the cost consequence? What's the consequence to your brand reputation and perception? So do you remember Chipotle and the massive E. coli food outbreak scandal? Do you think the company's risk management program was working well? February of this year, the company said its quarterly profits were down 76% compared to the same period last year. They went from having a profit of the, um, 68 million to 16 million. So because of this damage to its reputation and customers running away from the brand, Chipotle has had to spend far more on advertising just to draw back customers into the stores. So what you have done right there is not only have you lost your customers, you have given them the opportunity to find your competitors. And now they may, you may have totally lost them forever because now you force them to find some other alternative, right? So maybe they found Kava tasted much better than Chipotle. So now why do they need to come back to Chipotle? And no amount of marketing is going to bring them back. So how much would it cost your organization if some part of its wealth was compromised and to get that back? That's the type of future focus metrics you need to show. Another example is the data breach with Equifax that I talked about, right? The company has, it has cost the company nearly 10 billion in market value and the share prices have dropped drastically. So think about that. If the company had to invest in marketing and in building the public perception of security, what that means is, you know, the cost of putting in new systems, hiring new people to build back that brand name. That is the cost of recovering just the brand reputation and public perception. So looking at the, the ABCs, these future focus risk metrics will help you to cut through all the information noise and show value to the organization. However, do not underestimate the power of effective communication so it resonates with your audience. Organizations underinvest in risk management processes because they don't fully understand the value of risk management. You could have the best and the most effective risk management program, and maybe you even have the best future-focused risk metrics in the industry. But if your organizational leadership can understand and don't understand the value, they're, they're useless, right? So can you explain your business value to your leadership? Just as executives need to see the value in a risk management program, security professionals need to understand your organization's business and you need to have strong business acumen. Showing a bunch of metrics is not gonna do it. 
How you present them and communicate them makes the difference. Your business acumen skills will help executives to see that you understand the organization's business, you understand its customers, and how you can help the organization with its business strategies. Your metrics will help provide that evidence. So when you're using risk management metrics to show value, express them in business terms that management can understand. This is not the time to use uh, and show off your technical skills, right? technical lingo, right? Keep it simple. Keep the communication simple. Because all of your language has to be in terms of making the business more successful for all stakeholders, investors, executives, employees, partners, and most importantly, customers. You're not talking about mitigating risk. You're talking about creating business value by protecting the wealth of your organization. So your audience will not have the same passion as you for risk management. So you have to make sure, again, to keep it simple. So that means when you talk, when you write, and when you present, do that in, language, in a language that executives use, not your own language. And also keep it simple with your graphics and your colors and your messaging. If green means uh, good and red means bad, keep it consistent. Keep your graphics simple so people understand it. Also, help leaders to convey a customized message. Give leaders that elevator pitch so they don't have to think of what the elevator pitch is. You give them that elevator pitch because now then they can use that elevator pitch and use it with the board members and the customers and stakeholders and vendors. So what happens then is that your customers and stakeholders in turn are going to be more trustful. They understand your risk program in your organization and they're going to want to do more business with you. So your role in influencing organizational brand reputation, which means influencing customer behavior, and ultimately revenue should not be negligible. So I wanted to provide you some context and also help you understand the importance of your role to national security. Innovation is the key advantage that the U.S. has over all the other countries in the world. So other countries, are, as you know, are constantly looking for ways to hack into our organizations and systems and steal what makes us competitive, right, in the market. So I wanted to know how much it's costing our organizations and our country by not having enough risk management. And the cost, as you can tell in this slide, are alarming. By not having that risk management programs, a good risk management programs, we are undermining that advantage we have in our country. And it's not just the money, the economy, the impact of the economy. It's also, if you think of the human aspect, 45 million U.S. jobs are affected. Just and are going to be affected if something happens and our IP is stolen. So what happens? Well, all intellectual property can be stolen instantly from an organization, our educational institutions, and our research labs. If that type of world emerge, what incentive is there for any organization to exist, for any research institute to exist, right? Preventing this world outcome is the risk management strategy because that's going to ensure that our firms continue to operate and our economy thrives in the global market. So you have now have a good understanding of uh, current challenges, what, what you need for 2028, what's driving changes in the security and protection market in the next 10 plus years. You understand how you need to shift your mindset and how to shift your mindset. I've given you the platform to build your future focused risk metrics. My question to you, are you going to lean forward and make it happen? Thank you everyone for listening in. Uh, to this webinar, what we'll do is go into tofflerassociates.com and click on infographics, and you would see a summarized version of what I presented as a one pager. Think of that as uh, that elevator pitch that I talked to you about. Use that with your executives, and good luck. Thank you.